All right then, perfect. Well, hello everyone who is right here with us at the moment. Hi, thank you for the time, for the invitation. Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alberto Ortiz. I serve as medical director right here at World Stem Cells Clinic located in Cancun. And right here to my left, I have uh, Susana Hernandez. She is our research associate. She has two master degrees in science. And she is one of the one uh, in charge of making sure that everything that happens in our laboratory is uh, well, pretty much following re regulations as well as in the best condition possible. So um, I understand that the objective of this uh, Zoom call or this meeting is to answer some of the questions that may be popping up in different forums or during your research, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we are more than happy to help. I don't know if you people want to ask or you, you want us to answer some of the questions that uh, were sent to, to you. Have I written? Please let me know how can, how can we follow this up. Uh, we'll let whoever is in the group speak up if they want, uh, maybe write in the chat. Um, if, if they don't, then I will ask the questions that were asked in the uh, group that sure. I translated to English. Um, if anybody wants, to, to ask in Hebrew and I will translate. If you want to ask in Hebrew and I will translate it in English because it's hard to talk in English, then it's okay. If anybody is going to ask in, in Hebrew, uh, I will translate the question into English. Um, but I'm not going to translate back into Hebrew what you speak because uh, I don't think we have that kind of time. And uh, I think that will go. So tell us about your, uh, your clinic uh, some history, um, what kind of uh, traffic do you get? How many patients do you treat? Most of the people in the, in the group will be autism parents, but there are some with epilepsy, um, a few with Parkinson's. There are, there's a variety. It's mainly autism, but there's a variety of people. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, the clinic has been open since 2009. Initially, we, we only worked with bone marrow derived cells, and we also worked with adipose tissue derived cells, also known as stromal vascular fraction. Then in 2014 is when I arrived here to actually work. Uh, about six months later, after my arrival, we focused a lot in autistic patients treated only with bone marrow derived stem cells. Then in late 2015, we finally got our hands into the licenses needed to create our own private stem cell bank. That means that in early 2016, we were able to open uh, our allogenic umbilical cord tissue mesenchymal stem cell bank. And ever since, now we also have that alternative to treat our patients. Now, we do treat a lot of patients, pediatric patients on our let's say pediatric side of the clinic, which is World Stem Cells Clinic. That clinic is intended to treat kids with autism, epilepsy, and cerebral palsy. On the other hand, we have another clinic named as ReHealth. ReHealth is intended to treat adult patients only with uh, neurological conditions, respiratory conditions, orthopedic conditions, and anti-aging. So, uh, mostly in adult patients, we are treating them with donated stem cells or allogenic stem cells from the bank because of age and because of the age of the patients and because the stem cells from the bank are a healthy, clean, junk source to treat adults. In the case of pediatric patients, we have both options. I have here that there is a question, let me see. There is a question that says, I am interested in hearing the clinic experience with kids that have genetic disorders. That is a very open question uh, because we need to know what type of genetic disorders are we talking about? For example, in the autism world, there are kids that have genetic uh, fragile X syndrome, which is a genetic disorder. And those kids can be perfectly treated using bone marrow cells or treated with allogenic stem cell therapy. Uh, if we have a patient who has, let's say, Turner syndrome, which is a, a problem in the 17th chromosome, that, for example, that cannot be treated with the stem cells uh, in either one of the sources of the stem cells. If we have a patient that has a disorder, a genetic disorder that may be triggering a constant presence of epileptic seizures, 
they, they, there can be another alternative that can be treated with, uh, with the stem cells. There is a question in here that says, do you have nebulizer? Dr. Ortiz, we can't hear you. Reconnect. Just a okay. second. Now we can hear you again. Oh, uh, we hear you through, from Susanna's uh, okay. microphone. There it is. They can see you, but uh, they will hear you through the. Can they hear me now? We can hear you through Susanna's uh, uh, microphone, not yours. How about better? Yeah. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Super. Sorry. Uh, the, the initial question genetic developmental disorders. Some can be treated, some cannot be treated. Most of the genetic disorders may experience a positive improvement using stem cell therapy, but it will be potentially a temporary result. And we are talking about the symptoms. The genetic portion of the condition will not be addressed. That is a 100% honest uh, answer on, on our side because it's fairly common for us to have that question. And we have treated patients with different genetic problems, background problems. However, the stem cells are not going to be able to address or fix the genetic problem. It may help with some of the symptoms. Do you have a nebulizer with exosomes treatment? This question is becoming very popular. Everybody thinks that the exosomes are the ultimate holy grail, but in our opinion, they are not. We have exosomes in here. We manufacture exosomes in here. We use exosomes for orthopedic conditions because the activity of the exosomes is almost immediate. However, I uh, very respectfully speaking for kids mostly, autistic kids, they, they, there are a couple of studies pointing that exosomes in autistic kids, they can improve and they will improve. I'm pretty sure that they will. Exosomes are pretty much a large amount of trophic factors that are going to modulate the immune system. However, if we are talking about mid-functioning or maybe low-functioning patients, I challenge you to teach your kids to be able to inhale the exosomes without wasting them. So can we use them? Yes, we can. Do we use them? No, we don't, because there is also another thing that we need to take into consideration, and that is the safety. Exosomes are very safe to use. And uh, so, so, so can you, can you the, the problem in here, the problem in here, the exosomes with the exosomes is there may be a potential tiny possibility of an allergic response, right? Especially because either in health or intravenous, that is a systemic administration. And if the patient is allergic to something, then there is a possibility to trigger an allergic response. And that is something that I'm not willing to put our patient through. Now, as an alternative, that's why our protocol to treat kids with autism, the administration or the approaches to treat our patients consist of doing intravenous infusion of the stem cells, as well as doing intratical infusion of the stem cells. If we are doing the intratecal, also known as lumbar puncture infusion of the stem cells, you are infusing the stem cells into the cerebrospinal fluid, which eventually are going to reach the brain. I think that doing that is going to yield better results than only trying to force your kids or a patient to inhale the exosomes. Well, just uh, just to add a little bit of something, uh, we could use exosome as uh, Alberto said with uh, with adults. We use them with adults, especially with orthopedic conditions, and they worked really really well. The thing with exosomes, also talking like also a pharmacist, is uh, that we need to take care of uh, where are the exosomes going, and the things. 
with the stem cells are that they uh, go specifically to inflamed sites. Uh, if we use only exosomes, they would go wherever they diffuse. So uh, that's another reason to, uh, to prefer sometimes stem cells because we want them to specifically bind or specifically go where the inflammation is. And sometimes it's not only the nervous system, but also the gut could be uh, also affected or other systems could be also affected. So the cells could also go there if we administrate them instead of the exosomes. There's a question. There is a new question. Do, um, do you treat kids, autistic kids having apraxia such as nonverbal kids? Yes, absolutely. That is actually, that represents about 80% of our patients. Uh, most of the families, the main expectation is, A, is it possible for my kid to be able to develop some form of language? And the truth is, yes, there is always a possibility to achieve some, some form of language, whether if it's expressive, receptive, both uh, answering yes, no questions, pointing, improving social interaction. Yes, there is. However, something that is very important it's to identify what is the actual need of the patient. I don't want to convey it in the wrong way. It's very often in our case, most of our patients are coming from the US, Canada, the UK, part of the European Union. And it's very common for some of the families to say, I want my kid to be able to speak. Fantastic. Everybody has more or less the same expectations. As parents, I am pretty sure that you're willing to do as much as in your power to make your kid the best kid possible to achieve the best quality of life possible. However, when we have those kids here and they are evaluated by one of our therapists, it turns out that those kids have a lot of behavioral problems. And um, logic and evolution and, and the development of the milestones indicate that if we do not have some level of compliance, some level of cooperation, some level of attention, the speech is going to be delayed. If there is a problem, a gastrointestinal problem, the speech will be delayed as well or can be affected somehow. Actually, statistics indicate that 65% of the gastrointestinal problems are the responsibles of delaying social interaction and speech. Uh, does the team in the clinic include pediatric specialists? Don't get me wrong, but what is the objective of including a pediatric specialist when we are talking about stem cell therapy? Uh, uh, so to answer your question, no, there is no need in terms of looking for an actual pediatric specialist. The objective of our clinic is facilitating a stem cell protocol to help the kids uh, with autism. That way, when you are heading back home, you can discuss or complement with your specialist, with your pediatrician, with your neurodevelopmental uh, pediatrician or with your ABA therapist, speech therapist to complement with your team over there, what has been done in here, and maybe we can give you some suggestions to contribute to develop a better uh, uh, result with your, with your kids. Are they consulted when, uh, are they consulted with when the treatment is suggested? To be honest, when a patient is deciding to come here for treatment, we are talking about a patient that has been already diagnosed. It's a patient that has been already under some form of treatment, protocol, detox protocol, chelation, you name it, doesn't matter. My point is, considering that our protocol takes five days, between four to five days, diagnosing a patient or performing some other approaches is going to be completely off the table in five days. So every single one of our patients, pediatric and adult, are going to be diagnosed prior arriving to the, to the clinic. Another question that says, what is your protocol? Doses of stem cells per kilo of weight. As I was saying a few seconds ago, the protocol states that we perform two intravenous infusion of the stem cells and one lumbar puncture infusion of the stem cells. If we, if we are using allogenic umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells, we follow the international regulation. Traditionally, the standard dosage goes between two all the way to five million stem cells per kilogram of weight. If we are talking about a pediatric patient, 
we opt to be between 2.5, maybe 3 million stem cells per kilo of weight. That is the dosage that we use. Not so long ago, a couple of, of, of questions arise to our, arrived to our inbox tray and they were saying, there is another place that they are using 10 million stem cells per kilo. If we are talking about 10 million stem cells per kilo of weight, actual 10 million stem cells per kilo, um, mesenchymal stem cells, certified mesenchymal stem cells, it's going to be a lot of cells and there is a potential risk of triggering pro-inflammatory effect, which is going to lead the patient feeling terrible. And that is something that we have to be very cautious about. What laboratory do you use to obtain the, donate, to obtain the donated stem cells? We do not use any laboratory to obtain them. We manufacture them right here in our facilities. I'm going to paste right here into the chat box a quick link of a quick virtual tour, because that is what it is, of our laboratory. The stem cells that we use for our patients, we manufacture them, we produce them, and then we have to validate them. There is a very long process of, of validation process of quality control that we can, uh, in order for us to use the cells, especially because Mexico is different to the United States, is different to Canada, but we are regulated. And every time that any uh, agent of the health department visit us, we have to show evidence that the laboratory is sterile, that the stem cells are actually real mesenchymal stem cells, and that has to be shown with different tests and flow cytometry. And technically speaking, it's not legal to auto-validate ourselves. We perform at different steps in order for us to make sure that we are doing things properly. However, Susana here, she is the one in charge of making sure that everything is compliant with the regulations that are pretty much needed for us to perform the treatments. Can I ask well, a question? Of course, of course. Uh, hi, my name is Leo. Uh, I just want to know, uh, I'm a parent of a child uh, with autism, and I think that most of us in the group are already aware uh, to the uh, possible effectiveness of the stem cell treatment on uh, autistic uh, children. Uh, and I already um, treated him uh, for some treatment, but now there is a thing uh, which I ask from the practical uh, issue. Uh, we understand that every time that we are doing treatment, okay, and it depends on the child, but on my child, when I see every time I, I make a treatment, he is improving. Is not, it's, it's just not from zero to 100, but it's improving a little bit. And each time I do is improving more. So we understand we have to keep this uh, treatment as much as we can uh, every uh, maybe half a year or one year. And from the practical way, my question, uh, since you are from Mexico, there are several labs in Mexico which also uh, uh, manufacture uh, mesenchymal stem cells and they sell them for, I think the price is like uh, one tenth of your price, and I hear that family go for a person, for family members, and they have two treatments for the whole four in the same amount that um, you charge for one treatment. And my, my practical question is how can we know uh, what is the difference between the mesenchymal stem cell that you manufacture and the mesenchymal stem cell that they manufacture? Are there any parameters or a way to know the quality uh, I know that there is also uh, something which is called the passage that you can um, uh, culture the stem cells in two passages or five passages. Um, but, but just to understand what is the difference are, because I am aware that Panama says they, they select, and also I heard about Duke, they select the mesenchymal stem cells from each culture, from each passage, they only select those one which they see that have a anti-inflammatory uh, response. Uh, so there is some kind of uh, technology how to culture them correct. And maybe I'm just asking what way can we, the, the patients, the, the customers know where is better and if it's better, is it slightly better or is, it, is there a, a, a big difference between the, the labs? How can we know it? How can we be aware of it? 
Okay. Well, first of all, I, I'm very, very happy that you're asking this question because it's a very important one. Uh, I am a parent as well, so I totally understand what you're talking about. I know that we want our kids to be uh, safe. We want the treatment to be effective, but we also want to do it in a very effective, costly manner. So I totally get where we are coming from. The difference between us and other labs is that first we have all the permits and all the licenses that we need to uh, have so that we could uh, provide the, the service. This uh, issue is not, not uh, something that every other laboratory has. It, it has many, many steps, many regulations. It's very, very costly as well. So uh, we have them. The second place is that uh, we could see stem cells and they are characterized by being adherent to a plastic. I know it sounds weird, but when we are, we are culturing them, it's something that we look for. Uh, and they have to express certain proteins in the surface. And they also have to uh, be able to differentiate or to transform in other kinds of cells so that we know we are talking about stem cells. Uh, we make sure of all of these with many tests that, as Dr. Alberto said, uh, we do them here internally, but we also do them through third parties. This is also a very costly uh, process, and we do it on third parties that are uh, reference laboratories. They are not just any lab that could do the test, but they are uh, laboratories that are authorized by the government to assure that you're getting the product that you are getting, the real product, the real mesenchymal stem cells, but also about safety, that it that is our first priority. We also make sure that we have sterility standards. We do internal controls about bacteria, fungi, and also another internal bacteria called mycoplasma, that it's very common among cell cultures. And we also uh, make sure through the third party that it's a pharmaceutically uh, reference lab because we are providing a service that is for therapeutic uh, purposes that also the product is sterile before we give it to another person. So the donor selection also is a very, very important part. And this uh, involves doing uh, genetic testing of the cells, uh, the passages. We do the genetic testing through many passages so that we make sure that uh, there is no uh, mutations or alterations uh, for the following passages of those cells or the following generations of the cells. And uh, we use usually passage four for the cells, for the allogenic stem cells, and for the bone marrow stem cells will be uh, the passage equivalent to zero because they wouldn't have it uh, seeded before if they are fresh, or they would be a passage one, passage two, if we are already cultivating them and the patient come back and uh, administrate them. I don't know if this answers some of your questions, but what we, what I can tell you is that uh, we are very very confident of our product. We are we sleep just well. Uh, we know we are doing good, and we know we are doing the right things for us to provide you a service that is safe and is also effective. I just want to sorry. sorry. I want to compliment uh, what Susanna is explaining with something that I like to explain to all the parents when we have a conversation with them over the phone or, or video call. And that is here in Mexico, well, once my grandma taught me something, they who have nothing to hide has nothing to fear. And um, technically speaking, laboratories cannot sell cells. I mean, if I produce them, I cannot sell the stem cells to that guy over there uh, in a bottle. That's not allowed, that's not permitted. What I am, what I am allowed to perform uh, legally, it's me providing you a therapeutic service using stem cells because I'm going to be responsible of whatever happens during the treatment. That is completely different. So that's one. Sec second, I, I really appreciate this question. Sorry, it may be taking a little bit extra time and I know that there are maybe two or three more questions, but this one is very important. Nobody knows what is required to legally provide this treatment. It took four years to us 
to obtain the four needed licenses for us to perform this the right way. You were asking about, someone was asking about uh, safety. Uh, you were asking about passages. I'm pretty sure that if you ask people who buy the cells, they may try to explain what a passage is. But if they are telling you that one passage has more anti-inflammatories, that's not true. We are talking about stem cells. However, not every single place offer stem cells. Some other places offer cell derived products. There was a moment in which, uh, in, in one of those messages, they were telling me, hey, this X clinic, I don't know, I don't care, I don't want to know. My intention is not to point any clinic. Someone told me, this place is giving me 50 million cells for $1,000. I highly doubt that if we actually count them, it's going to be 50 million cells. If we run them through a flow cytometry process, the same process that we follow, not performed by us, performed by a third party place. If we run those 50 million cells, I can bet you guys a free treatment that is not going to be 50 million cells. If any, it's going to be a million. Another even thing. Though, even though they have in the website uh, Cofres, uh, which is the Mexican uh, equivalent to the FDA uh, number, even they though, have some kind of permission. Especially if they, are, if they are buying them from a third party laboratory, the process of purchasing stem cells is not allowed. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, I believe it was you, Mr. Leo, that you were asking about how to make sure and the passages and everything. One of the main things that is very rarely explained is the importance of quality. Yes. There is a question that is fairly common stating, what if a genetic problem arises after a stem cell? What if a, a side effect happens in the long term? Technically speaking, that should not happen if a properly stem cell is harvesting adequately. We have to do, in order for us to create one bank, we have to study or to evaluate the initial set of stem cells and the following passages chromosomically and genetically. So we have to perform 20 karyotypes of the stem cells every single time that we have to create a, a bank or a new bank. That takes about seven months. If in karyotype number 18 or in karyotype number 15, one of the results say that there is a mutation, we have to start all over again and select and handpick a new donor. I cannot use those stem cells if I'm going to, to, to offer them for a therapeutic approach. That is a tricky part. Quality this control kind of states. Thing, yes. This kind of thing can happen. Did you see? I mean, is it a one in a million or this is something that that you already uh, have seen, that it, it can be- We, uh, we uh, have seen it before. Our first donor, our first donor was a very kind uh, uh, friend of, of a friend, actually. They donated the, the, the cord, which is the only thing that we needed. And more or less on passage, in passage nine, there was a mutation in one of the chromosomes. Actually, it was chromosome number 17. We cannot use those stem cells. However, we have to let the donor know that there will be a problem with that kid in the future. Mm. That kid now has Turner syndrome, which is a problem in, in chromosome number 17. Now we cannot use that product in any of our patients because that doesn't fit our quality system. I'm pretty sure that more than one laboratory may be doing this. But if there is someone offering you stem cell for $2,000, I highly yeah. doubt that they are doing that. Second, you said, you said passage number nine. It means you are not you are not treating with passage number nine. You are treating with passage number three or four, but you continue yes. to you continue to culture in order to see what happened next. This is something. Yes, that because you do. we have to we have to evaluate though the passages represent, let's say, a yes. decade or, or or represent the life of the cell from passage zero all the way to passage 10, 15, or twenty represent the life of the cell. From the moment that they are very, very baby cells, all the way that they are old cells about to die. We use, but, as, but as, as Susana will, was. It will be uh, in vivo. I mean, the, the, once you inject passage for, for, they will continue to uh, multiply and they will well, continue. With the, I'm sorry. Yeah, the stem cells, uh, 
before on the 90s and early 20s, uh, 2020s, well, 20s, actually, zero uh, 2000s, uh, we thought that uh, stem cells would uh, bind to sites and then would stay there. But actually, the therapeutic uh, capacities of these cells are now involved with immunoregulatory abilities. So the stem cells, yes, some of their grafts in the tissues, but most of them will just only uh, have like a, like a cloud around them, surrounded by uh, many growth factors, neurotrophic factors, uh, factors that are immunomodulatory. So they would reduce inflammation as they go. And also they would reprogram the cells that are, are already there to do their best. I know it sounds magical, but that's how it's on, on it's reports, call, not only by us, but, on, but from other people. It's what they call paracrine effect. Exactly. That's the paracrine effect. You have read, really read. So I'm very yeah. glad. Very interesting questions. But yeah, that's the paracrine effect. That's, that's the main, main effect of the stem cells recognized now. Not, not just the engraftment, but the paracrine effects. Finally, just to, to, to finalize the question about the price and numbers and all that stuff. Quickly, I know that it's just a, a quick image. You see here a bunch of cells, and you see here a bunch of cells. Which one do you think has the more cells? This one or this one? This one, the big one. This one? But they are that dead. No, that, that one, no, no. The upper one, no, the, this one. This one. Because the cells are not alive, or it seems that the one that are not round and uh, solid. Well, no, this, no. But the, the objective of my question is not to know if you know. The objective of my question is, if I put this in a regular cellular counter, this is going to throw me, let's say, 100 million cells because I, the, 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 the machine is counting every single spec. If I, have, if I count this one, the final number is going to be maybe 10 million cells. From both, the one that I need for treatment is this real cells, cells that are expressing markers from the membrane. It is useless for me to say, yeah, sure, I'm going to give you a bunch of cells just because my counter says so. And maybe 70% of those cells are not actual cells. Maybe it's the debris of the cells. Maybe some uh, the, 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 the cells are in apoptosis, or as you were saying, some of them are maybe dead. The viability may be low. If I count everything, it's going to be an astronomically high number. This is what I care about. If I am telling that our patients are going to receive 50, 100, 150, or 200 million cells, I have to provide a certificate that I am actually giving you 200 million cells with at least 93% of viability. That is something that most of the laboratories or some of the clinics are not providing. But uh, that is how we manage things. That is how we may be a little bit more expensive or a lot more expensive. And, um, but yeah, um, we can be on and on with this uh, uh, for, for a long time. If you want to, we can have a, part, a private meeting in the future, that's not a problem. Now, following the, some of the questions, um, can we do the treatment intravenous only or without the lumbar puncture? Yes, we can, but my question is why? The objective of the lumbar puncture is to make sure that certain amount of cells are going to reach the central nervous system. There, there is documents, there are some papers, publicized papers stating that the stem cells intravenously are not going to uh, bypass the blood brain barrier. They're not going to go through it. About one to 1 1.5% of intravenously administered stem cells may go through the, through the blood brain barrier. If we want, to modulate the immune response and suppress as much as possible inflammatory responses here, we need to perform a lumbar puncture. That's why we do it. So to answer the question, can we do it without the lumbar puncture? Yes, but it will not be our uh, autism protocol in this case. Are mesenchymal stem cells linked to cancer? My medical answer is no, but I'm pretty sure that's just Question. Yeah, actually, I, I, I already uh, answered that in the text. Uh, as I said, adult stem cells 
and this means not from adults necessarily, but from tissues that are got, uh, gotten postnatally. So umbilical cord stem cells, uh, bone marrow stem cells have not been linked to cancer or a cancer risk. However, this is a risk that we may see on embryonic stem cells, which we do not use because they are more, uh, they have more risks than benefits until now. And we have adult stem cells, so there's no need to, for us to use them. Another question. question I have here. Um, what is the price of the treatment? The base price of our services always have been $19,000. However, as we always try to explain to our families, autism is the only, well, actually, pediatric patients are the only, let's say, set of patients or the only niche of patients in which we always offer them a discount. So, right now, 2022, the discount is going to be 15% off. That means that the final price is 16,150 US dollars. And that includes everything that is needed for the treatment. Now, are you using uh, Wharton jelly and placenta? Uh, not exactly. We are using a, a, let's say, a hybrid, for example, uh, for lack of a, better, of a better word, of Wharton jelly and the cord of the cells. And this is another question that she can answer because she's the one culturing them. Yes, actually, what we use is the uh, uh, umbilical cord lining. So I'm trying to get a picture for you because I had some prepared. But um, just let me check. How can I do this? If I can just paste them on the chat. Uh, no, actually, they're not. They are you not want to share your screen? Yes, could I, uh, please? Yes. If possible, yes, because I have many, some slides that could illustrate what we're doing. I'm not giving the presentation, just like illustrating okay. some of the stuff we are talking about. I made you the host of the okay. uh, chat, so now you can share a screen. Okay, thank you, thank you. So this, uh, this is the image I was trying to show you some a little bit ago. So this is the cord lining just uh, below the surface of the cord. This is the Warthon jelly. And we do a special also patented technique uh, to uh, get these cells. This is the dissected uh, uh, umbilical cord. And what we used is just the, this, this side, okay? Um, we avoid the veins. Uh, we could also bank the umbilical blood, uh, cord blood, but uh, we usually just use these cells. And this has been these cells have been characterized and also used for many many years with good results. Actually, this is one of our our cords before processing. <laughs> and this is a lab on, on the back. And, and there was, I'm sorry, there was another question about which kind of cells we use. And uh, the cells, as I told you, these are the embryonic stem cells that we are not using. They are dangerous uh, to use because of their uh, carcinogenic potential. But we use these adult stem cells uh, and we, we basically get them from the umbilical cord and also from the bone marrow. Now, there is another question saying, uh, what, is what is the certificate? certificate? Can you send, send us your certificate so we, so we can see? see. I cannot send you the certificate because it's not yours, it's not mine, it's from the patients. However, we do have an open policy. The quality control? Yeah, sorry. Um, the, the certificates or everything that is provided to a patient is binded to it's very similar to the HIPAA in the US, which is a privacy policy. So unless a patient actually allows me to share information, I'm able to do so. That is very important, especially for autism community, at least on this side, on, 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 on America, because most of the families following or doing this type of treatment, they are afraid to pretty much express it publicly due to child protection services. So. Uh, the important part here is that if a patient, even if you're on vacation or if you want, we can meet privately, we can show you everything in the way that we are doing it right now. We have a full binder of it uh, in, in how we do it. One of the reasons why we don't 
upload this for public access is because there is a clinic that has a very similar name without one letter and it's based in India. And about two or three years ago, they were even piracing our videos, our testimonial videos. So with that said, I don't want, we don't want to upload everything that we are doing to be public domain in order for them not to fake it. Now, uh, however, Susanna has in here a, a image of more or less of the certificate and what has to contain if we are using umbilical cord derived stem cells. Once again, it's super important for every time a patient receives allogenic stem cell therapy, for you to know what markers are present and what markers are negative. If there is no marker of, uh, if there is no uh, expression of these markers, maybe we are talking about a cell that I product and not a mesenchymal cell. So um, I will show you the certificate of analysis of one of our lots. So, sorry, so that you can see what we, uh, the test that we do. And I can also share with you again my screen so we can check the requirements for the stem cells to be considered actually mesenchymal stem cells, which is like uh, to be adherent to the plastic, to have these markers, and also to have the differentiation potential, which we, we do. And we have the test from internal testing and also the external reference testing. There is another question saying you, you have experience, experience treating essential tremors with stem cells. Essential tremors, do you mean Parkinson's? Uh, because with Parkinson's, we do have experience. Essential tremor per se, tremor is a symptom, it's not a condition. So it's just a matter to understand why a patient is having tremors and from that point on, identify if it's something that can be treated with the stem cells. There is another question here, same person, is the IV intravenous uh, impact enough? Partially, depending on how functional or less functional a patient may be. Is it enough? Technically speaking, about 70% of the clinics that we have heard from our patients, the last thing that I do is uh, researching other places. I don't, don't get me wrong, and I'm not, I don't want to sound arrogant or anything like that. I don't care about the competition. Competition makes everyone better. Uh, the, the, the thing is here, if there are clinics stating that IV works best for them, fantastic, because that is what they are used to be working with and that's how they have been evolving their protocols. In our case, we work with both approaches for kids with autism because that has that's how we have been submitting our protocols. That is the protocol that we have authorized as well as that is the protocol that we have been evolving for the past four years. And for the same person, very important question. Thank you for that one. What would you recommend for parents who are afraid of the treatment, whether if it's intratecal, intravenous, bone marrow, doesn't matter if it's autologous or allogenic cells. Answer that question right here in two minutes is going to be impossible, but I can offer you exactly the same thing that we offer to the rest of the families. It's completely free. We can have a private conversation and I can show you with images how we work. If there is a question, ask for it. If, it's, if something is not clear enough, let us know. What we want, something that myself and the rest of our medical team, we try to focus a lot before any patient makes the effort of coming all the way here is to make sure that your need of information has been addressed. Doesn't matter how simple or silly it may be or how complicated the question is. The idea is not that we know everything because we don't. However, we know what we are doing. And in order for us to convey that, I want you to make sure that your need of information is completely satisfied. What are the risks of the intratecal infusion? Since we are doing this mostly in pediatric patients, doing an intratecal infusion is very, very easy because the spaces between the vertebras are very wide. The lumbar puncture is done in the lumbar area. It's not done in the neck. It's not done in the thoracic part. So the lower, the better, the lower, the safer. That's one. Second, if any of our patients complain of a potential side effect, usually is feeling the sensation of maybe nausea for about a couple of hours, 
And that is not even because of the procedure. That may be because of the sedation that our patients are going through in order for us to perform the, the protocol. And the sedation is uh, using sevoflurane only. I don't like to use intravenous drugs to sedate our patients because some of the patients struggle to metabolize intravenous drugs. And we also uh, have to mention that the intrathecal uh, infusion is on the hospital, not on our clinic, which is right across the street, actually. Very important question. What is, actually, this is a really nice one. What is the explanation for initial regression after treatment in terms of aggression, hyperactivity, agitation of violence, temporary for three or four, or four months? There is an, actually, there is a scientific explanation for that. I'm gonna give you an example. Maybe she can give like a scientific explanation. I like to use examples in order for our families to understand. Let's pretend that you are engaged in a room with nothing to play with, absolutely boring room for about a month. And then on, on, at the end of that month, you are authorized to go outside for one hour. The very first thing to do is you want to move, you want to enjoy, you want to breathe, you want to do a lot of things that you were not able to do in that boring room. More or less the same thing happens at the central nervous system. There is inflammatory responses hindering proper synapses. There is inflammatory, resp uh, uh, inflammatory response hindering the GABA uh, receptors. So when you address that, that has been chronic for one, two, three, four, 10, 20 years, and you start reducing that inflammation, that impulse, that electric conductivity, that metabolic uh, response at the GABA channels are going to increase. It's going to be normal for a kid to respond at least with hyperactivity. It's true, it doesn't happen in everyone. It mostly happens in kids who are mid-functioning, maybe pointing towards the low-functioning side of the spectrum. Why is this? Again, following the simple explanation, they can feel overwhelmed, whether if it's by the, 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 the sound, the, the smells, the touch, or most important, visually. That's why some of them can become slightly more hyperactive. In some other cases, they can become, they can increase their steaming, uh, the, 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 the steaming symptoms for a couple of weeks. On average, what we have been informed by our patients is mostly that they experience this between two to three weeks after the treatment. Just as uh, Leo is asking, some patients experience it for about two, maybe three months. Yes, it's true. However, after this revolution of, of, of senses, some nice uh, 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 improvements can, can start to show up. In fact, something that we highly recommend to our patients after, immediately after the stem cells is as soon as you can, please uh, stimulate your kids. The stem cells are not going to be the final results to, 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 for autism. They help. They help with the main triggers, they help with the main causes of it. But if you want your kid to be able to improve in socials or in, or, or in language, in any type of language, or if you want your kid to improve a little bit more on even motor skills, those per definition is a skill. It's something that you have to learn and practice until you dominate it. Expose them to that. It's, it's, it's uh, in, in our opinion, is the best time for them to be exposed. If you see that they are losing concentration or attention in, I don't know, in the speech therapy, okay, give them some time out and, and provide them another activity. The idea is constantly feeding them with activities, never free will. The, the, the routine has to be set by, in this case, mom, dad, the therapist or the school. Never allow them just to have absolute free will because following the rule of life, we are designed to follow the path of the least resistance. Is it recommended to do hyperbaric chamber therapy after the treatment? It's recommended at least on our, our recommendation is to wait at least three weeks after the treatment. If you want to do it before, that's even better. As part of the treatment, do you offer usage of food supplements? We do recommend them only if the patient needs it. We, we, we as a stem cell clinic, we do not tell you, you need magnesium, you need this or you need that. We provide a list of some supplements that are specific to some symptoms, assuming that the patient may need it. However, before just bombing any kid with any type of supplement, it's going to be very important to evaluate if it's needed. Uh, I am completely against the one in everything pill. 
because you do not know what is working and what is not. So I'm, I'm reading another question about uh, the culture medium. And that's a very, very interesting one because uh, Lior says, I read that using the media which MSC was cultured in, it can make effect similar to cells were injected due to the growth factors that the cells expressed. Yeah, so the cells express cells factor and it's all over the media. And this is called actually conditioned media. We used it for orthopedic and also for topic applications like on skin to regulate some inflammation. Uh, however, as exosomes, the conditioned media is not target to the inflammation sites. It's just like the signals that the cells would be using to modulate the behavior of surrounding cells. But that doesn't mean that the media uh, would get specifically to the sites where it needs to be applied. So we used it for, for other applications, not for autism. Is it necessary to stop biomedical treatment or any other type of uh, uh, protocols uh, for or before the stem cell treatment? No, at least on our clinic. And as far as I understand, we are one or maybe one of the few that do not ask to change or stop any previous protocols. Uh, the reason is simple. Let's pretend that you are doing Kerry Rivera protocol or you are doing some biomedical protocol or if you are doing a supplementation or a combination of two and you are noticing some positive changes, even if it's tiny ones, it doesn't matter. Nice, a, a positive change is better than no change. I don't want, we suggest, we encourage the families not to stop it, just to come for treatment. Because if you're going to be here for five, six, seven, or 10 days, depending where you're coming from, I do not know how much benefit, how much control, how much assistance that protocol is providing to the immune system of those kids. So if you suppress it, especially if you abruptly suppress it, it is possible for that kid to feel uncomfortable or to express it somehow during the treatment time. It's not exactly like, it, like it's going to affect stem cell activity, but it can make things uncomfortable for the kid. And at least on our side, we constantly remind ourselves, we are working with kids. We don't, how can we say it? It's like, we don't uh, try things out with kids. We are not using kids as guinea pigs. That's why we are a little bit reluctant of changing the protocols of something that is already working uh, uh, just to, to, to treat different kids. I mean, if it was my son, I wouldn't like to be the first one to be treated with something, especially if I am the one paying. So that's the, that's the reason why we don't use the condition media. That's the reason why we don't use the exosomes. How would you feel if your kid who is myth low functioning struggles, barely struggles to be sit down and then you have to shove a syringe in the nose in order for them to aspirate exosomes. I'm not saying that exosomes inhaled exosomes are not working. Actually, we have a protocol for that for other type of patients where we are talking about, about adult patients. In the terms, in, in, in kids, uh, we, on our side, protocol side, we have to make sure that the actual protocol is easy going for them. So if that includes maybe sedation for the bone marrow, we are doing the sedation for the bone marrow. It's a lot easier for them, less invasive, uh, easy peasy basically. In about in less than three hours, everything is done. And by the time that we are finished, they are even running around in the hotel. So um, again, I'm not saying that exosomes are not useful. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we focus a lot on the comfort of our patients. And also, if I may add, I, it's not very scientific, but I think it's biological. Many of us are parents and we do not do things that we wouldn't do on our kids. So that's a very important. We are very conscious about them. Sometimes we see them as ours. So uh, we try to put safety first and also, of course, very important efficacy. We have, what is your experience with single gene mutation disorders causing epilepsy, developmental delay, and ADHD? We have treated patients like that, but the amount of that that recollected is been very minimum because it's not a very large amount of patients that well, we have treated with, that, with, with those conditions. They can improve, yes, uh, especially epilepsy. 
uh, developmental delay is going to be very important to identify if a side of potential muta mutation disorder, if something else may be triggering it, especially if it's hormonal. If it's hormonal, the stem cells are not going to be too much of a help. And uh, ADHD, ADHD, just like with autism, there are possibilities to improve. However, ADHD in particular requires a lot of supervision on the side of the parents. That is what we have seen. A question from Hi, what kind of follow-up is a patient expected to get from your clinic? As much follow-up as the patient is willing to accept or to cooperate with. There was a moment in which we were bombing constantly our patients in order for them to reply to us, I'm happy or I'm unhappy, I have seen this, I have not seen, I have not seen this. So there was a moment in which they were, were, were sending our messages to spam and we never knew nothing about them. So uh, we are more than happy to follow up with them. We are more than happy, as long as the family is okay with it. There are some families that do not want to be contacted for the following six months because I'm quoting one of the moms, actually one of our favorite moms, do not bother me for the following months until I see some changes. What, what is my power against that? I, I, I don't want to bomb her with 20, 100 different uh, uh, messages it, it, just for her to hate me by bombing her email uh, inbox. I rather respect what the patient says. What about natural killer cells to treat autism? That is a fantastic one. Um, I know there is research on this type of cells. What about neural stem cells to treat autism? Regarding natural killer cells, here in our clinic, we work with natural killer cells. The problem is the manufacture of the natural killer cells. In order for us to actually re uh, uh, compile or obtain or harvest natu autologous natural killer cells, we need at least a blood sample, a peripheral blood sample of at least 120 cc in kids. In adults, it should be about 160. And the harvesting time takes 23 days. In order to make the best viability possible, the administration of the natural killer cells should be done on, 20, on day 24, day 25th at least. Technically speaking, a natural killer cell is a cell that is going to eliminate as much as possible, any cell that is compromised by anything. Even if it's a cell that is not working, if it's a cell that is contaminated, a cell that may be uh, compromised by viral infection, it's a treatment that may be of help. However, we have the problem of time, especially if you are based on Israel, if I have patients coming from Dubai, if I have patients coming from the UK, or even if I have patients coming from, from the US, doing natural killer cells is a little bit impractical. However, we do work with them. We usually use them for patients with cancer. Um, and the neural stem cell. Susanna, you're muted. Sorry. So, sorry. So, uh, and what I was talking about is that natural killers could also create a pro inflammatory environment, which we are not, we do not want to create on autistic kids. That's just because of the natural activity of just killing and digesting and just releasing some factors that could create more issues in these patients specifically than uh, solving stuff. I lost where is it? Um, Let's go from the clinic. Can uh, you walk us through the protocol? A uh, family with a child with autism comes into the clinic on what day and then what happens? Sure. Uh, considering the fact that most of the questions are for allogenic cells, we're going to focus on that type of protocol. So uh, we usually begin on Tuesday and we finish on Friday. Tuesday, we want to make it as easy going as possible for the family because you are traveling from different country. You may have some questions that you have been thinking in the plane. You are afraid because you're going to uh, Mexico in this case. I don't know what's the image that Mexico is, 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 is providing to the rest of the world right now. I know the image that is being conveyed to the US, but I don't know what's the image that is being conveyed to Europe, for example. So once the family is thinking on all the, all the things, uh, we focus on the first day to address the questions, even if those questions have been answered before. Then focusing on our patients, we perform a quick physical evaluation. We uh, and we finish the day with uh, performing some blood work. Since we are going to do lumbar puncture infusion of the cells, we require PT and PTT times, which is coagulation times. We also run a CBC count. We run a complete metabolic panel. We run hormonal panel, and we run uh, C-reactive protein and rheumatoid factors. The idea is having a baseline regarding blood behavior, 
metabolic behavior and inflammatory behavior, even if it's general inflammatory markers. As soon as we finish, we take you back to your hotel. Then on day number two, which is the important day, we meet early in the morning at the hospital. What I mean by early in the morning at the hospital is maybe seven in the morning because our patients have to be fasting in order for the sedation process to happen. Do we require the sedation? Yes. Why? Because we are going to do the lumbar puncture. Why we do the sedation? Because it, it eliminates completely fear factor, anxiety, motion, and increases the safety of, of the lumbar puncture. Traditionally, we invite mom or we invite dad or a family member who is coming with the patient to help during the sedation process. It is and it will be always a lot easier for a kid to fall asleep in companion with a family member. Once our patient is sleeping, that family member heads back to, to the private room that they already have assigned. During the, during the time that our patient is under sedation, they receive intravenous infusion number two, the intravenous infusion number one, and uh, intrathecal infusion. As soon as we're done, we close the gas, our patient will start to wake up. Before our patient is fully awake, we take them back to the, the room next to their parents, because what we want is for our patients to wake up next to the family. It's a lot easier to wake up next to mom and dad than waking up next to me or the, our team in a cold place. So as soon as our patient is awake and aware, we take you back to your hotel. Day number three, Day number three consists on meeting here in the clinic in order for our patients to receive intravenous infusion number two. This time there is no need for sedation. We perform a traditional IV infusion or an IV push depending on how cooperative or non-cooperative the patient may be. Usually this visit, we like to make it very quick, half an hour perhaps. And after the visit is done in here, we take our patient and the family to visit a therapist. What we want from our therapist perspective is for our therapist to know and understand as much as possible what the needs of the patients are. The reason for, for why that is very important to us is because it's countless, it's been countless times that some families tell me, I have been going to ABA therapy for six years and I have not seen anything. I have been going to a speech therapy for two years and I have not seen anything. Perhaps that kid does not need ABA therapy. Perhaps that kid does not require, in that precise moment, speech therapy. Maybe there are some other aspects that need to be addressed or worked out before. That is what we want to happen with our uh, uh, therapist evaluation. And then on day number four, which is Friday, the last day of the treatment, we like to have a final interview with the family in order to address questions, to run down the, the suggestions that we consider are beneficial to your kid as an individual, because it's pointless for me to give you 200 different suggestions, but maybe 10 can be useful. And finally, uh, we provide you with the laboratories that were performed during the week and explain them to you. That is how we run it using allogenic cells. So, so there is another question. What about high functioning kids who have no problem to inhale? Once again, if exosomes are useful for, for kids with autism, that's fantastic. I don't use them in our protocol because I am not willing to risk the integrity or the, or the safety of our patients, at least with how the exosomes are um, collected or harvested in our end. Every single cell that I product, if it's preserved, they are suspended in some form of media. If any one of you has ever experienced an allergic reaction, as simple as it may be, you only require one protein of that allergen to trigger a response. I don't want to trigger any of that response at the central nervous system level in a kid. I have nothing against exosomes. Again, we manufacture them, we use them. However, if we are doing lumbar puncture infusion, there is no reason to, to uh, perform the, 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 the exosome administration. I, and once again, quoting what Susanna was explaining, Exosomes and stem cells work in a different way. Is, there necess is it necessary to do blood tests before treatment? Why are you checking? What are you checking with it? Before the treatment, we run our baseline laboratories to know how the patients are doing that way with the intention to have a metabolic baseline, blood baseline, and inflammatory market baseline. It's not that it's mandatory. We do it because those are yours. That way, if you want to repeat them three or six months later and you see a decrease of it, 
that means that an inflammatory response is going down. When do you think neural cells will be a realistic treatment product? What do you mean by neural cells? There are two, two definitions of neural cells. One, it's a stem cell that is harvested from a neuro, neurodevelopmental product. And then we have mesenchymal stem cells that may be nourished with some form of neurotrophic factor, which is something that Susanna has another answer to. Yeah, actually, uh, I think what are what you're referring to, if I am not wrong, is that um, well, mesenchymal stem cells could uh, go to a differentiation process in vitro, so in the lab. So we could uh, culture the stem cells so that they differentiate or transform themselves in neural cells. This is, I, I don't have to sell this to you, but this is very exciting. I am very excited about the idea. However, there is not enough evidence yet to use them. And we are sticking off first what it's safe and what it works. If science and all the progress that is going on right now uh, takes us to use neural stem cells, we are more than open to use them and, and uh, well, uh, make better the life of more children. Another question, do you use exosomes IV or not using them at all? Once again, it's not that I don't use them at all in kids. Everything related to autosome is associated with some form of deficiency of the immune system. Granted, exosomes are very good at modulating the immune system in general, randomly and immediately. In kids, we do not need, we do not need that specifically. In kids, we need a, a stable immune system modulation. Let's put it this way. If you go to work every day and your coworker is terrible, your productivity is going to go down. Now let's put that example into the immune system. If your immune system has to go to work every day to fix different areas, which will be wearing down or be exposed to any invasive or whatever, but your coworker, in this case, your environment where you're supposed to be working it's toxic, the productivity of the immune system is going to be terrible. That's why kids with autism struggle a lot with sensitivities. That's why they have a lot of problems with gastrointestinal problems. That's why they have different levels of inflammatory responses in, uh, at the central nervous system. That's why there are different complaints about it. So in our opinion, the way we see it, again, uh, we are not against exosomes, Exosomes may be very important for an immediate response, but it's not going to be even midterm in terms of effectiveness. It's pointless to have exosomes as a single therapy. If you use a stem cell therapy, eventually the stem cells are going to release exosomes. Exosomes are harvested from stem cells. So I don't know what would you choose. Having cells and, and promoting, because it's not even my uh, uh, information, Recent reports state that after stem cell therapy, the potential of improvement and actual visual or quant quantifiable uh, uh, changes, you can notice them even up to eight months after administration. With exosomes, it's not that far. With exosomes, you may be very happy because everything is happening very quickly. However, what will happen if some pro-inflammatory agent or activity may happen within the first month? So that's the reason why. Second, once again, focusing on safety. We don't want to risk it with our patients. Uh, just want to add a little bit of something. Uh, I, uh, it's like you have like the cells are the exosome producing entity, and you want the cells to be on the inflamed sites or the sites that are affected. So you want the exosomes to be released or the these factors, this paracrine environment, as we called it. We want it to be released on specifically on the same site. So that is more concentrated on these sites, not systemically, because otherwise it would be it would dissolve. And about the amount of uh, uh, of exosomes that we could use, it's not that uh, they are totally uh, inert or they do not have activity. So therefore, we could uh, uh, fill uh, the the kit with exosomes. Not that there is not that kind, there's not that kind of information is not available yet. Stem cells have been used for more time than exosomes at this time of our lives. So we would have to wait for some years from now to estimate a correct dosage of exosomes for kids. 
Actually, actually that, that uh, answers the following question. The, the dosage of exosomes is not limitation as opposed to the stem cells. There is no rule of thumb. Uh, just for you to have an idea, our exosomes are suspended in a five milliliter bottle and they contain 20 billion exosomes. I cannot put 20 billion stem cells in five milliliters of, of, of solution. So it's not that one is better than the other. They serve different purposes because the mechanism of action is different. So if we pay so much attention to safety, and if we, if we overdose a patient with the stem cells and we trigger inflammation instead of addressing it, you're not going to be happy. Nobody knows yet what are the dosages or the safe dosages to use exosomes. And I don't buy it when uh, recently a, a friend of ours was telling us, well, you just measured it by vials. If you know the size of an exosome, that's why you can fit 20 billion exosomes in five milliliters. It's not that you just measure vials. You need to know what you're doing in terms of number because once again, maybe anti-inflammatory, but there will be a moment in which initially they can trigger pro-inflammatory response in order for the white cells to start addressing inflammation. What happens if you push too much and you actually cause inflammation? So once again, we are dealing with kids. I mean, I understand the, 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 the fact that lots of information is floating around. Maybe different clinics are providing different information, but that is how we are doing it, focusing primarily on the fact that we care about of the safety of the patients. It's it would be very good. Hi, uh, I'm Shira, I'm Chigal's wife. Also, um, I'm a developmental nurse. Uh, it would be very good for the sake of our group if you can put something, a, a short passage on exosomes. There's going to be other clinics after you who will also explain about their clinics. And I know that different places has different approach about exosomes. It's a very new territory, a lot less um, explained than stem cells. And it will be very good if you can put together some passage about it and we will translate it to Hebrew. So the information will be more accessible, especially about the risks of exosomes and what they mean, because I think this information is not out there enough for patients who are looking for help. Yeah, uh, what I, yeah, actually, that's right. We, we, could, we could work on that, but it's all that an equilibrium of safety versus benefits. So we have a risk, safety versus risk. And we have to always, 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 always balance it on safety. So what we want is to provide a safe therapy that could also, that is also going to be effective. And exosomes, there is a reason there is not a lot of information. It's because as you well said, it's very, very new. And we want the kids to always, always be self, be safe, okay? Another question, is there any reason to split intravenous from nebulizer treatment? And why do you split intravenous into two days? Well, why do we split the intravenous into different applications? On our experience, one is comfort, and the other one is because of the phenomena of pulmonary entrapment. That's one. Second, once again, it's not that we do not work with nebulizer. In order for you to nebulize any cell derived products, you need pressure, and the pressure is going to break the cell. In, in my perspective, if I'm going to pay X amount of money, $20 or $200 million, doesn't matter, if I'm going to pay for a, a cell product, stem cell product, cell that I product, and I'm going to nebulize it, the nebulizer, the, the mechanical nebulizer, the air nebulizers, they manage different pressures. All of them are going to break the membrane. If I'm going to give you in a tiny bottle for nebulizing or in a suspension to, for you to inhale it, and if, if I, let's pretend that I put 100 million cells in one nebulizer doesn't matter what type of nebulizer. And then you inhale them, the mechanical process of vaporizing them is going to destroy at least 90% of the cells. So you will be paying X amount of money for nine, eight million cells. Again, I am not against the, the concept of it. However, 
we also have to consider about the quality of it. If a patient is aiming to receive 100 million cells, 150 or 200 million cells, depending on the weight and the, uh, if it's an adult of a kid or a kid, I'd rather them to receive actual real functional cells. It is pointless for me to provide them with, let's say, cell debris, just because you are nebulizing them and breaking them. So that's something but, uh, very important good regarding- Good question about it, because there's a big difference between a nebulizer, which uses air pressure, or mm -hmm. oxygen to push medicine up your nose or through your mouth. And there's a difference between nasal drops um, in terms of cell breakage. Does nasal drops or even a nasal inhaler, uh, will that work with secretomes? May work in terms of improving viability. Mechanical oxygen air push nebulizer, cold nebulizer, destroy up to 95% of the cells. The, the ones that are in drops or like the A-frame ones that are just one, one single push, those ones preserve up to 50, maybe 60% of the cells. Our concern in here is if it's going to be a patient who is going to be cooperative, go ahead. I give it to you if you want to when you're here. That's not a problem. Let's try it. But if it's going to be a patient, especially autistication, mid low functioning patients, that's not going to have, it's not going to be absorbed. They're going to miss it. We've done it once. So it's not a happy event for the family when the family is looking, their kid being for doing something, something they don't, they don't, don't want do. to do. So, so it's, it's, it's also another thing that we have to take into consideration. Peace, Peace of mind of the family. family. I mean, and, and we are being very honest because we could also make the vials, give it to you, and we are giving you what you are you are buying. I mean, we could give you two billion exosomes in the vial, but we could not care how are those exosomes going to be, or even the cells, how are those cells are going to be. So we are also being very ethical about it because we want you to get the best results. That also brings us more patients that brings us also more joy for our work and we want to be very responsible about how you are also administrating the cells so if i will for example if my child is cooperative and he's going to be willing to do nasal drops um, and i would like to take some home with me to treat them at home is it possible and if so how do I uh, take them with me? Does, do they need to be frozen? Do they need to be in a cooler? Because it's quite a long trip from where you are from anywhere in the world uh, back home. Actually, that is a problem. How to preserve the stem cells. If you suspend, actually Susanna has been working for the past maybe six or seven months with stability tests of, of the cells in order for us to we understand that there are some patients that cannot come here and maybe we have to move in our other adult clinic. Uh, it's about half an hour away from here. It may not sound like a 20 hour from Israel to Cancun, for example, but even in half an hour of the wrong conditions, the cells can be dying. So we have to take into consideration, again, quality of the product, even the warmth of your hand, while so let's pretend that this is the, the, the recipient where the cells are, are, are located in order for you to inhale it. By doing that for more than 20 or 30 minutes, the warmth that your hand is providing there is going to change the environment of the cells. And some of the cells may be compromised, maybe a little bit, doesn't matter. 5%, 10% doesn't, doesn't matter. Now, imagine that, just as you're saying, because you have to go to the airport, you have to be checking all that stuff, the trip, and, and arriving home and then carry on with it. So it's not, as far as I'm aware, the protocols available using inhaled exosomes or in, inhaled cells, in not, it's not something intended for you to travel with. Technically, it should be part of a administration protocol because that way you are actually making sure that the amount of cells, the, via, the viability, and most importantly, how the cells are suspended in order for them to be inhaled, it's actually viable because there are different ways to transport the stem cells uh, let's say from one state to another for international travel, if you want to, but that requires different chemicals or different substance in order to preserve stability. But some of those substances may be allergenic. And I don't want, again, any of our patients to 
realize that they may be allergic to any of those substances in order to preserve the cells. I don't want them to realize three days later or after the, the flight that they may be allergic to it. So that is a, a, one of the problems in here. If you actually, if you suspend stem cells only in saline solution, viability is less than an hour. In less than an hour, you are going to notice that the amount of cells will be dropping. The, 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 the viability of the cells will be dropping. And room temperature, I'm not even saying that you're holding them. So it's something to pay a lot of attention to. And that, that's something that we uh, are watching on the internet. They are selling you the vials, but how they are being managed doesn't give us a lot of uh, comfort because they don't. it doesn't make sense. The cells cannot be uh, viable that way. They are, and if they are not bad act, they are not gonna work. So you could also by the cell destruction of the cells, creating more uh, pro-inflammatory particles. And I don't know, it's, it doesn't make sense. And uh, we don't trust that kind of, uh, of treatments. It will make sense if they don't name them stem cells. Yeah. If they tell you, if they tell you that it's, I don't know, condition media, if they tell you that it's, I don't know, cell powder, or if they put the name of that you want, doesn't matter. As long as it's not advertised as a stem cell, it may be understandable because it's a derivate. It's something that has been lyophilized. Uh, it's something that may have uh, the needed properties to be transported as a pharmaceutical product, but not as an alive bio biological product. That's completely different. Yeah. Um, is there a different method of preserving exosomes to use in nasal drops that may be uh, portable, even in a cooler? If uh, the company provides you with a cooling tank and you can take it with you home, for exosomes, not for a uh, full stem cell um, that can be used from one country to another? It would, it would depend on the medium that the exosomes are suspended with. And uh, there's a, there are some substances called cryopreservants or cryoprotectants that are supposed to help uh, that the vesicles or the, the exosomes and the cells also, if in theory, could, didn't break when the water gets in a different temperature. However, uh, these cryopreservatives or cryoprotectants are not very friendly usually to the rest of the normal temperature cells. So it can cause uh, irritation, and it can cause a lot of discomfort. So this is something that not just us, but many laboratories are working on. So there is no real straight answer for that question yet, I'm afraid. We know there are lots of clinics who sell exosomes in inhalers uh, for patients to use when they travel back home. What you are saying now is very alarming because we see a lot of clinics um, maybe their method of uh, production is different than yours, I'm not sure. Like we invited you, we are inviting different clinics to come and explain their methods here, uh, because we think that our patients or patients in general should hear what you have to say firsthand. Um, but what you are saying now is that uh, you have not found a method that will allow patients to, and correct me if I'm wrong, to take those inhalers out of your clinic, travel with them, and keep them safe to use once you land. Am I correct with what I'm saying now? Well, you could have cell-derived products. Exosomes are vesicles created by cells. Uh, and these are uh, vesicles that are usually created when the cells are dying or they are processed in a very specific media. So these vesicles as cells could break with uh, temperature changes. However, uh, these proteins that are inside the, the exosomes could be uh, maintained, refrigerated, and they could be also frozen, and it could be like a protein extract of the cells, of the mesenchymal stem cells. These can be, uh, you can travel with. However, you cannot expect to watch the particles as they left the lab or the cells as they left the lab 
if they are uh, preserved for that amount of time outside the lab. And those proteins, they can benefit autistic children? Yes, the proteins are what we are looking for when we are using stem cells. However, uh, the difference is that if you administer these proteins without them being targeted to the inflamed sites, they are just going to be diluted. You, they are going to be all over your system, but they are not necessarily going to act specifically where you need them to be. And with stem cells, we are making sure that the, uh, the stems go to the inflamed sites and they create a high concentration on site of those proteins so that uh, the patient could have a real, real effect and a durable, a more durable effect also, because they are going to, uh, with that uh, concentration of proteins, they could also reprogram the uh, behavior of the surrounding cells. Thank you. And, yeah, and also about the question about the nebulizer. Uh, the thing is that some exosomes may be destroyed. That's a fact. But they are going to be destroyed and the proteins inside of them are going to be released. So it's not like it's going to waste, but it's not going to have the same activity or viability as before. So is there a point, if somebody has done a full course accordingly of your protocol, and they want to take home something that provides extra help, not the main part of the treatment, but will provide extra support. Is this kind of treatment to take back home? Will it be beneficial or is it just a waste of time and money? <laughs> That's a tricky one because everybody has their own way to make a cake. I have my own recipe. Another clinic has their own recipe. I am the last person, and her included, we are the last person with the last clinic in the whole universe to question how and why different places are doing things. Because in science, there is no single way, no, there is no single way to reach the same objective. In fact, one, our affiliate laboratory located in California right now is working on how to make exosomes in powder in order to make the transportation of them for cosmetic purposes, but to make the transportation of them easier and also to make them pharmaceutical, pharmaceutically available. Mm -hmm. There is a question in here. So is it possible to buy exosomes? No, you cannot buy them technically because it's a cell derived product. It's, it's, it's a biological product. So the reason why we do not provide exosomes outside of our protocol or in order for you to take, it's because the core objective of us treating kids is that we are taking full responsibility of what's happening here. That's one. Second, if there is other places, there are other places, regardless of the clinic, that they are giving you exosomes as part of their program, that's great. As long as the situation does not cause any harm, I have nothing against it. It's, it's uh, uh, as long as it's proven to be safe, I have nothing against it. So if there is a, a family, if there is someone that has tried them and they are claiming fantastic results, honestly, fantastic for them. I have nothing but to say about them, nor the clinic, nor the product for the protocol. We are working with something, we are working with our protocols because those protocols have been approved in order for us to be transparent, either for anyone who comes here and ask, or in the case, the authorities evaluate us, which is a big problem in the case that someone comes in here and check you up, perform uh, some form of, auditory and you don't have the evidence that backs up what, that you are providing what you are claiming that you are providing. So that is another aspect in which there's a reason why we are not like stepping away from our protocol just to stick with something that right now it's legal and authorized and also that we are right now sure that it's safe. Again, I'm not saying that it's unsafe to use exosomes in kids now. I know of three clinics uh, here on the American side that they are using exosomes. But when you ask the family, okay, how many exosomes did they give you? They cannot answer you. Uh, to me, that's, I mean, if you go to buy a car and they tell you, sure, here is your keys, but you don't know what car are you buying? I mean, it's, but you already pay for it. So uh, I, I don't like that, that, that approach when, when families cannot answer you something that technically should be explained before. 
again, not pointing on any clinic in particular, it's just something that in some cases, marketing wise is very interesting because it seems to be practical. Hey, I, I went for stem cells in XYZ type clinic and they gave me my three, four, five bottles of exosomes or, or proteins or supplements or something to top off my, my treatment for the following two, three months. Great. What are they composed of? What is it? The reason why I, I question so much the families that have done so many things before is not to be annoying with them. Is because something that I learned the hard way in the, specifically in the autism community is that they are very finicky of what they are using and what they are doing and what, what protocols they are following. So because I learned that, in some cases, it's a little bit difficult for me to understand how did you accept something without having an actual explanation before it. So that's why we focus a lot on, on uh, safety. While we are on the topic of food supplements, I, as you all know, I see lots of different clinics and in a lot of them, they advise or even sell the clients, the patients, a package of vitamins like vitamin B12, like uh, uh, ginkgo biloba root and et cetera, things in those uh, lines. Um, are there any supplements or vitamins you advise your patients to take? We, we advise based on the symptoms that that kid is expressing. We may advise based on how deep in the spectrum that may be. However, it's not like, here's your package, go home. No, because something that is insanely difficult to keep balance off in a kid with autism is a gastrointestinal tract. If a kid, I have seen it with my own eyes. During the treatment, one kid cheated, AKA the brother gave something with a cookie or a McNugget or something like that. that. That particular kid was craving for the same thing for about two or three days and the family was questioning what happened. So, if you are going to forget about stem cells for a moment, if you have been putting so much effort in a diet, in tests, in supplements, in protocols to try to maintain the ability of your child to poop correctly, leave it like that. If you have achieved that point, you are in a better position than 75% of the patients. There is no need to change it. In the case you, want or are evaluating on, on, on supplements, at least evaluate it one by one. The common one or the commonly suggested ones are zinc, magnesium, maybe vitamin 12, but the precursor of it, which is methyl B12, in some other cases, hey, I'm going to give folic acid. No, the suggestion is folinic acid because that fulfills a gap in the, in the, in the metabolic cycle of, 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 of the folinic acid. If you're going to be glutathione, there are 3,000 different brands of glutathione. So do your research before. That's why we are not going to say you need this or this or this or this, because I do not, in five days, it's impossible for me to identify if a patient is lacking some of those. So that's, that's the important part. And if you are willing to try it, uh, the suggestion is doing it one by one and evaluating every three to five days in order to see if a family is identifying some negative uh, responses, if, if in the case there are any. Same thing with diet. If you want to introduce ingredients or foods, do it one by one. Heavy metal. There is a question. What do you think about heavy metal? Some clinics make it a condition of low amount of lead and mercury for treatment. Let me answer that with a question first. Well, before that, there are kids who can get rid of heavy metals in one, two or three months. And there are kids that can get rid of heavy metals in three or four years. With that said, does any one of you have four years to wait? I mean, if you are asking today because your kid is four years old, are you willing to wait three or four years to, to perform a treatment, assuming that is something that you want to try? Most of the answer that I have received is no. In our opinion, it's pointless to condition having a treatment 
in, in just to have low levels of, of, of metals. It's not that easy to eliminate. Some of them it's easy, some of them are not, especially if you do not know the metabolic process of it. So it's not conditioned on our side. We can treat a patient, we can move forward with the treatment, even if there is presence of mercury of, of, or lead or any other heavy metal. What we do recommend is, you know, because you are telling me that your kid has heavy metals, we can go with the stem cell treatment, but you need to do something about the metals with or without the cells. That's, that's, that's true. But it's not like we are going to reject a patient just because there is presence of heavy metals. It's like rejecting a patient because there is dysbiosis. Okay, but there are clinics who request this test ahead of time. Yep. Why? Yep, correct. Because some say that, uh, as far as I understand, some say that the presence of some heavy metals will destroy the stem cells. Technically, that's not exactly accurate. I'm saying technically, because what we have seen is after treatment, some of our patients have shown, have sent me the reports of the heavy metals lower after the treatment. So let's focus on the mechanism of action of the cells. The cells are not going to kick out heavy metals. The cells are going to, once again, focus and improve environment and activity of the immune system. The better the immune system, the easier for whatever system to improve productivity and the easier or the best way any system may be working, it can be slightly or a lot easier for a system to start acting the way it should be acting and perhaps getting rid of the metals. So that is our answer as a clinic. I understand that maybe some places will say, hey, I cannot receive anyone with excessive presence of heavy metals. Okay, what is the definition of excessive, right? If you have been living with tons of heavy metals for 10 years and you have done nothing about it, maybe right now doing stem cells is not the right one for you. However, if it's something that has been somewhat chronic, more or less under control, but still high, you're more than welcome. Can you give antibiotics after stem cell treatment if needed? The antibiotics are not going to affect the cells. There may be a handful of antibiotics that can actually disrupt the cell membrane but it's not very common for them to be prescribed. In fact, during the expansion process, Susanna can complement on that one, uh, we use some antibiotics to preserve the sterility of the, of the incubators and the, and the culture uh, cells. However, the cells are washed and we make sure that the antibiotics that we used on the culture are already gone before giving them to patients. And I would add that there are some antibiotics that act over the, the ribosomes, like uh, the fluoroquinolones, and those may be affecting the functioning of the cells, but they are not the only option of antibiotic that, that you need. No? So if the kid needs antibiotics because uh, it's a live dead situation or it's needed, so yeah, you should give them to, you, you should give the antibiotics but they are not, uh, usually they do not uh, affect the activity of the cells. Um, we have a very common question, uh, especially here in Israel, about uh, radiation post-treatment, so x-rays, MRIs, and CTs. It's very common because a lot of these children are under medical investigation to see what is causing the secondary um, condition uh, like epilepsy or sometimes uh, bowel disease. And so they are needing to do these tests. What do you have to say about it? It's perfectly safe. In fact, one of our protocols required the treatment to be done under fluoroscopy. That's some level of radiation. Uh, other, other of our protocols require for us to inject different articulations and we have to perform pre and post uh, x-rays that require some level of radiation. So uh, technically speaking, the thing that should not be exposed to a long process of radiation should be the cell compound. Uh, and and by, by being exposed, it's like, I mean, it's not like anybody's going to do it, but like X-raying the cells, well, maybe a tiny person of them may be affected, but uh, uh, once you actually administer them, there is no reason why it should be a problem with it. Besides the amount of radiation that you may be exposed to, between one all the way to maybe 12 different x-rays, depending on the set of, of or, the, or what you want to evaluate with the x-rays, is not that high in order to actually destroy a tissue. Uh, technically speaking, MRI, CT scan, and MRIs, the level of radiation is not that high as well. That's why you can be exposed to it for 20 minutes, for example, which is more or less the average time of an MRI. 
so uh, if any, the only thing that we are against is using anti-cancer treatments that may actually suppress or destroy the cells, but that technically speaking, that doesn't have anything to do with the autism community or pediatric patients in most cases. Okay, so if uh, one of the patients that uh, has been in your clinic needs to do x-ray, even very close to the procedure, no problem. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's a very interesting question. So a question about COVID. Yeah. If, if the kid will get COVID, something else during the flight back, the cells will be wasted. Actually, no, there is no reason for the cells to be wasted. Maybe the result can be a little bit affected initially because during the time that COVID as a virus or any other form of virus is present in the system, the virus has to replicate. And in the meantime, that's happening, you're going to feel tired, you're going to be possibly developing a fever, some other symptoms. And the ugly part of COVID, the early, uh, what's the word? The early, let's say the early stages of COVID or the initial uh, um, uh, type of COVID that we were dealing with, those usually created something known as a cytokine storm. And we have a protocol to treat COVID patients who are uh, incubated. So technically speaking, COVID can be treated up to a certain extent with cells. If any, if a kid get or if any patient uh, catches COVID or any other viral um, co condition immediately after the treatment, first of all, it's something that we have to catch before because we perform COVID tests to our patients during the time that the treatment is performed. So assuming that that happens, we have to provide the necessary assistance to it. If, it, if it's been uh, catch one, two weeks later when you are back home, you just have to follow the, the evolution of the condition and that is it. Nothing is going to be like it's going to be wasted or anything like that. Again, some discomfort maybe happen, some, some symptoms on the side of the kids, especially maybe present like headaches and whatnot, irritation basically. However, until the patient is clear of such infection is when you may be able to notice if something actually negative happened. But, but an actual disease or condition to actually affect the cells, not really, not directly. And actually, when we, when this old COVID uh, thing started back a few years ago, uh, there, were, there were people actually uh, asking us if the cells could get COVID as well. So, but the receptor that COVID uses to enter the cells is not present on mesenchymal stem cells. So these wouldn't be an issue either from that side of the, of the treatment. I have one last thing to say. Um, oh, before that, there is a question. I think that she meant wasted uh, in the terms that mesenchymal cells will be busy treating inflammation or cytokine storm instead of autism cause. Cytokine storm is something that will happen at least 10 to 12 days after. So if by the first three or four days, nothing evolves, that, that patient is completely safe. Second, either way, our immune system is dealing with inflammatory responses daily, whether we like it or not. Even if you have, uh, I don't know, a smoothie tonight, your immune system will have to be dealing with something as a potential inflammatory response. So once again, it's not like it's going to be wasted. It's true. If, if there is a recommendation before coming for treatment is try to arrive in the best shape possible uh, with the intention to make and have a comfortable treatment with the intention to avoid a potential infection. So I know that avoiding getting infected, it's slightly difficult, but as long as you follow regular sanitary uh, rules, it should not be a, a, a problem. And um, I have a tiny request. Um, and that is, uh, we are about, well, I am about like five minutes away of a meeting with uh, uh, our vice president of research and development. So I don't want to be the party pooper. Um, if you want to, we can meet again next week in two weeks, you name it, doesn't matter. Uh, however, I will have to hang up in about five minutes.
So if you get COVID, is it possible to combine autism and COVID protocol? If you have COVID, you're not even allowed to travel. So it's it's uh, it's not like you are going to treat one or the other. So if you have COVID, you're not even allowed to travel and you have to quarantine at least for five days. Nowadays, for five days um, after your positive test. And if you want to board the plane, you cannot board the plane until two weeks, 40, 14 work, about 14 days after your negative test has been uh, obtained and you require a medical exemption for you to travel, certifying that you are pretty much risk-free. We haven't had that situation where we get a kit that we are treating with ASD and also the COVID protocol. We are very, very careful about the biosafety measures. So we haven't been in that situation before. So uh, once again, guys, I think that uh, because of the tiny rush that I have in about five minutes, I have to say goodbye. Uh, but sorry for, sorry for me saying that. I mean, if it was for me, I can stay for another three hours. It doesn't matter. But um, <clears throat> I am. I think that speaking on behalf of Susan as well, we are more than open to to speak ten times again. I mean, uh, uh, something that we enjoy uh, the most is explaining this. Because at the end, if you if you choose to come with us or not for treatment, we like to believe that regardless of where you're going, you are making the right decision. So uh, uh, I will, the right and informed decision, which is at least to me that's important. So uh, if if there is any question, I'm going to leave my. If you don't mind, uh, how I uh, can I leave my email address, or or you can share the questions to us, or we can set a new time. You name it. We will uh, send our group of um, stem cell interested people all of your information. And also you appear on our website clinic list. So it's not a problem to get in contact with you. In the behalf of the stem cell Israeli patients community, we thank you very much for coming here. Your lecture was very um, interesting and important for us. And we hope to see you again here for another lecture in the future. As many, as many as you day. want. I mean, <clears throat> she likes to teach uh, at a university. I, I am considering on teaching at the university. So uh, again, if any of you guys who is listening or whomever may be watching this later, if you have a question, please approach to Hagai. Hagai can share our information. This type of conversation is free literally it's no cost no the fact that you want us to have a conversation with us does not represent that you will be here it's, it's not it's not commitment right again for us it's very very important because we know that there is people doing the right thing in the same way that we know that there is people selling crap sorry selling the wrong type of aspect uh, uh, because of that we want to inform whomever may be interested about how this is working and, and maybe what we are available to do here because eventually there will be another place that may have the option of doing something extra. But uh, if we can be of any help, it's absolutely free and we are more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. It is nighttime here. It's nearly time to sleep for most of us. So we are going to say our goodbyes. Um, and again, we hope to see you very soon for another interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Laila Tov, Khaveri. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good day. Bye.